Michigan keeps living down to its reputation as an ethical mess. The medical marijuana licensing scandal just keeps churning. And the final stroke is applied to a Detroit masterpiece on the East Riverfront. Today is Sunday, October 22nd, 2023, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, right, welcome to Flashpoint. I often describe trying to keep up with a wild swell of news events as like trying to drink, drink out of a fire hose, and that is certainly where we are right now. Everything from the situation in Israel to a trio of strikes that we've been following back here at home. But I'm trying to keep my eye on the ball as it pertains to one of the worst scandals ever to, to hit Lansing. We had two more sentencing hearings last week in the medical marijuana licensing morass that is already centered on the former Speaker of the Michigan House. Could it now ensnare the former majority leader in the Michigan Senate? And why is it that despite a lot of candidate talk, no one ever seems to do anything about Michigan's transparency and ethics standards, which are, sad to say, pretty much the worst in the nation. We're going to talk about all of that this morning. We're also going to talk about a part of Michigan that is among the nation's best. Yesterday, the opening of the Uniroyal Promenade, which completes the East Riverfront on, on what has been a, a revolution on Detroit's namesake waterway. It's all this morning on Flashpoint. Well, Wednesday of last week, two former lobbyists became the latest to be sentenced for the mind-numbing corruption case involving marijuana licensing, bribery, and the former Speaker of the Michigan House of Representatives. And that case in itself is just the latest in a string of corruption cases across Michigan that leave us tagged with a reputation for being one of the least transparent, most ethically challenged states in the country. Let's talk about it with the U.S. Attorney from the Western District of Michigan, Mark Totten. Mark, thanks very much for the time today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, every time I turn around, this case gets bigger and bigger and crazier and crazier. It, it involved uh, bribery, which we've seen before, gifts, travel, sex. If you're a Hollywood screenwriter, you don't need to embellish this at all. But try to characterize the general trappings of investigating this case and what you keep finding. You know, this was an industry that held out a lot of promise. Last year, it, it reaped $2.3 billion sure. in, in revenue here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Everybody who wanted to get into the this green gold rush, as some described it, had to go through the Michigan Medical Marijuana Licensing Board. And Which does not exist now. That's right. Yep. But what we now know is that the chair of that board, Rick Johnson, uh, in quite brazen fashion, had been accepting, soliciting, demanding multiple bribes over a long period of time, had created a system to hide them, received over $110,000 in, in direct payments, in luxury travel, in commercial sex as well. And, uh, you know, we, we were able to hold him accountable, uh, but, but it was a long time coming. I'm sure there's an interesting story in how you decided the dollar amount of the commercial sex that he was receiving. We'll leave that uh, for another conversation. But when you say it was over $110,000, it seems very clearly more than that. There was a payment made, according to the filings, of a, 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 a Chaldean business group uh, put up a million dollars to uh, Johnson was one of three people that were kind of involved in that but there seems to be an eye-popping amount of money that was swelling around this you know we've been careful to say at least a hundred and ten thousand right, dollars right. nothing specific uh, uh, you know we are focused particularly on on the money that was transacted while he was on the board that's what the the federal statute that's the scope of the federal statute, um, but certainly there have been there have been reports of, of other amounts. We had these two uh, uh, sentencing this past week, but I, I have the every indication that this investigation is nothing close to being over. I wanted to let you respond if you wanted to to the reporting of this past week. Craig Maurer of the uh, Detroit News, who has been on this like a very hungry dog on a bone, uh, reported that there was about eighty thousand dollars that changed hands from uh, an organization that Rick Johnson had to uh, an account controlled by Arlen Meekoff, who at the time was the Senate majority leader. So how far does this continue to go? And do you want to comment on that? Because this was that's actually a finding from your own filings, your own evidentiary filings. 
So I think all I can say at this point is that the investigation is ongoing. That's obviously compatible with having future charges. Uh, it's compatible with, with not having future charges. We have a very high standard of proof, as, as you know, beyond mm -hmm. a reasonable doubt. Uh, we have statutes of limitations, and you know, we have to make sure that if we're going to bring a case that we feel confident, we can satisfy that standard uh, at a trial. And so, you know, that, that shapes what we do here, and, and all I can say really is that the investigation is ongoing. In corruption, it takes two to tango. Actually, we're finding a lot more than two on each side, but it takes two sides of this. You have bribers as well as bribees. How, where do you find the onus? I mean, I, I imagine you do hold public servants to a higher standard than those on the other side, but if I'm offering a million dollars to get into the medical license uh, that I want, I'm pretty culpable of bribery too. You know, look, there there is blame on all sides here. Uh, everybody who gave uh, who solicited bribes, Rick Johnson, everybody who gave the bribes has culpability as well. I think if you look as, at the sentencing, um, you will see that Rick Johnson got uh, 55 months, four and a half years. That was far and away the most stringent sentence that was handed down here. I think if you listen to what the judge said mm -hmm. when she was handing down the sentences, she uh, echoed what I, th what I think you see in the law as well, is that there's extra culpability uh, for the person who holds public office, but, but everyone's responsible. Uh, I was going to ask you if 55 months sounds like enough to you, given the damage that it does to our faith in institutions and in our government leaders. You know, Rick Johnson is over 70 years old. He's going to spend the next four and a half years mm -hmm. in, in federal prison. I don't think that's any small thing. Uh, we're pleased with these sentences. We think they send a really strong message. And I'll just add, you know, if you look at what the national averages are for bribery sentences, uh, in 2022, it was uh, 23 months. In uh, 2020, it was 15 months. And so uh, 55 months is in, in the scheme in that context is really quite a significant sentence. And I think we'll send the much needed strong message here that there will be accountability for those who commit these crimes. We would need a ton of time for you and I to go through all of the corruption cases that have vexed the state of Michigan. This one is centered on Lansing. We also have the Lee Chatfield investigation, which continues. We've seen Macomb County. We've seen lots of problems, obviously, over the years in Detroit. We get so much lip service from politicians every year about trying to create more transparency, better ethics laws. Nothing ever happens, and we are routinely um, noted as being one of the worst in the country. What would you suggest, <laughs> and what would you advocate that we do? What would help fewer things land on your desk? You know, this is, this is obviously a major corruption uh, case in the state of Michigan. Yes. Um, you know, I'm not a policymaker, and I'm not, I'm not going to weigh in on particular proposals, but I'll just say this. I think anybody who is in a legislative role, is in a policy-making ro role, needs to pause and look very closely at what happened here and ask if what we have is sufficient. Are our financial disclosure laws sufficient? Are uh, the Freedom of Information Act law we have, is that sufficient? What about the rules that govern lobbyists? Are there you those... go, because Rick Johnson went from government into lobbying back into an appointed position of a government agency. That seems fraught with peril. You know, again, I think I think there's a lot of questions that, that, that need to be asked here, and we need to figure out, do yeah. we have the rules in place that shed sun, sunshine, that shed yeah. light on, on what's happening so that there's accountability? Mark Totten, Totten, it's really good to have you on our side of the state, yeah. and I uh, really appreciate you coming in to talk about it. I'm sad to say we will probably talk again more about this. Thanks, Stephen. It's <laughs> great to be here. You bet. We come back. We'll continue with more. Uh, don't go away. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Let's continue now with this reputation that Michigan sadly deservedly has earned for being uh, one of the least transparent, most ethically challenged uh, states when it comes to government and governance anywhere in the country. And I want to bring in now two guys who have been flummoxed by that fact so many times over the years. Uh, Stephen Henderson uh, is the uh, host of Detroit Today on WDET and ML Elric, of course, the columnist for the Detroit Free Press. ML, the last time you were on 
on this program, we were talking about uh, reporters being consigned to the basement of City Hall. Heaven forbid we should be anywhere where we can see or hear anything. That's just of a piece of all of this. But as I just said to Mark Totten, to have Rick Johnson go from Speaker of the House, then into lobbying, then back into an appointed position, that paints a pretty clear picture of the challenge ahead of us in this state, isn't it? Absolutely. You're asking people who have a limited lifespan in the legislature who like politics and who apparently like money <laughs> to uh, not try and turn their experience into profit. It's, it seems like an unreasonable proposition that no one is going to adhere to unless we pass some legislation that says, if mama didn't raise you right, we're going to pass some laws that at least help you find out where those guardrails are. But there's very little will to make this happen. <laughs> You're going to blame people's mothers. Wow. <laughs> uh, let me bring in Stephen. Stephen, uh, the FOIA picture uh, in this state alone um, is, is so frustrating. Uh, we're the only state in the country, I believe, where neither the governor nor the legislature uh, is subject to FOIA laws. Uh, candidates talk about it time and again, and yet nothing happens. And just this week, uh, the terrific reporter for Bridge Magazine, Jonathan Oosting, asked Democrats why it hasn't happened yet. They said maybe next year. It's more uh, suggesting that it's very complicated to do. Yeah, um, uh, the chair of the House Ethics and Oversight Committee uh, said that uh, this requires a tremendous amount of research and thought, and that they didn't think they could get it done this year um but you know meanwhile we just keep pulling dirty fish out of the water um and and we never change the water uh, we we assume that the, the, it's the fish and not the water um but but it absolutely is in michigan i mean the, the environment here invites uh people to push the bounds of ethical behavior of legal behavior um, and even when they're caught, um, you know, the punishment often for what they've done is just not what you would see in other states. Um, you know, this has been building for an awful long time uh, in Michigan. And if you think back to the, the, the sort of inflection points that should have uh, gotten us to think of, of this differently, I mean, you can go back 30 years to the, the, the Senate fiscal agency or the House fiscal agency scandal uh, yeah. that... that uh, uncovered by the Detroit News. That should have told us there was something wrong structurally. We still aren't there. Uh, ML, it's interesting because, yes, there, there would need to be some agreement uh, among legislators, but on some things, not so. Governor Whitmer could at any time just unilaterally subject her office to FOIA, and yet that doesn't happen. Yeah, so the, the governor campaigned on bringing some more sunshine to Lansing. And she has done a few things. I think there's been some improvements in open meetings for some of these state boards and commissions. And she has provided some of her own financial data, which is great. But the thing is, she said she was gonna make the governor's office subject to FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, and she hasn't. Yeah. Her position since being elected is it doesn't make sense for the governor's office to be subject to FOIA, but not the legislature makes perfect sense to me too but that's not what she promised when she ran for office and it's about time for somebody to show some leadership leadership sometimes means doing something that the other guy needs to follow not saying i'll do the right thing when you do the right thing because if we all lived our lives that way we have a lot more of what we have right now yeah. which is the wrong thing yeah mm -hmm. Stephen, ethics laws don't solve everything i mean states that have much more stringent ethical codes and uh transparency laws still have their problems as well but uh, after the lee chatfield uh sort of odyssey i didn't think anything could surprise me but the depth of this medical marijuana licensing thing a board that no longer exists again i'll mention uh it, it just com it is still absolutely jaw-dropping to me yeah, um, I mean, and this is about revolving door politics, right? Uh, you can go from being in charge of government and government money uh, to lobbying on behalf of people who want to get government money uh, very seamlessly in Michigan, very easily. And you can do it without much disclosure. Uh, in 2022, we did uh, tell the legislature that they, they need, lawmakers need to have much more personal financial uh, disclosure than they do. They haven't even been able to formalize those rules yet. They're supposed to do that by the end of the year. Um, we, we, we are moving at a snail's pace toward 
uh, a, a place where these kinds of things aren't routine. Uh, I mean, the number of lobbyists in Lansing um, who used to be in the legislature is staggering, absolutely staggering. And you don't have a way of tracing what they were doing while they were in office to even set up the things that they are trying to do uh, after, they're, after they're gone. We've got to change that picture so that it's clearer to, to everybody, not just, and you know, people tend to, to cast this as something that's about the press and our access to these things. It's not, this is about voters uh, understanding and information. This is about right. citizens knowing what the people who represent them are actually up to. Uh, both of your comments kind of lead me to wonder about the role of term limits in this. On the one hand, you'd think, look, if you're only going to be in there for a little while, you have the freedom to actually go in and do the right thing. Uh, but the other, and, and, and that people that are entrenched, sort of rusted into a place, maybe are not uh, incentivized to change things as they otherwise might. But I'm wondering, you both have described the, the revolving door part of this. ML, uh, are term limits part of the problem here? They are in terms of the number of uh, fresh meat looking for jobs as lobbyists. As, as, as Stephen rightly pointed out, when Dominic Giacobetti got in trouble for some improprieties, that was 40 or 50 years ago and we didn't have term limits. Yeah. The, the problem is, there's a lot more temptation now. And frankly, there's a lot fewer reporters scrutinizing it because we've just lost so many jobs well, in yes. journalism. Meanwhile, the number of lobbyists, their ranks grow. And uh, that's that's not a healthy ecosystem. There's a lot of a lot of bad fish, as Stephen would say. Well, and Stephen, yeah, we've got about 20 seconds left. Your thoughts on the, on the role that term limits might play in this? I mean, term limits have been a scourge across the board. I mean, it was a bad idea uh, and it's it's, taught us over the time that it's existed uh, that it's just made all of our problems worse. We took a small step uh, to easing those a little bit in the last election. Right. Uh, I get rid of them. Yeah. Stephen Henderson, Emma Elric, I always love uh, talking this kind of shop with you guys. Thanks so much for the thoughts and on we go. We'll take a quick, uh, quick break. Back with more as we talk about a big new centerpiece on the Detroit Riverfront. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Welcome back. It is tempting to say that yesterday they put the cherry on top of the Detroit Riverfront development, but it is actually a much bigger part of the Sunday than just the cherry. They took the wraps off three and a half mile east riverfront and what is now known as the Uniroyal Promenade. Let's talk about it with Mark Wallace, the CEO of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, and Matt Cullen, the chair of the Conservancy. Guys, first off, congratulations. I mean, this is a long time in coming, isn't it? Big day for sure. It really was. I, 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 I'm hesitant to talk about it as, like I said, the cherry, Mark, because <laughs> this was a massive piece that I think was, was it the toughest part to get to pull together? Yeah, there, there were a lot of tough parts, uh, but this one was a very complicated site. Yeah, the, the history of industry on that site was profound. Uh, There's a lot of contamination that we had to deal with, and also a lot of legal. You know, there's been a lot of questions about what to do with that site. It's a tremendous opportunity because it faces the southern, it's on the water, Belle Isle is right there, but it's also very challenging. So we're really excited to see it get done. Uh, it's funny, uh, we were talking earlier, <laughs> Matt, the, it, it was Uniroyal, uh, the Uniroyal site until like 1979, 1980, somewhere right. in there, got knocked down a few years later, but the Uniroyal name has remained kind of it, large it, it, it in has. people's kind of like We're waiting for something new to come and displace that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a big day for us. And uh, culmination of 20 years of effort, right? Yeah. And so yeah. lots of uh, dreams and drawings over the years, over the past 100 years. But uh, we were able to stand there yesterday and say we were able to get it done. So I'm really uh, excited for everybody. In fact, let me let you both reflect on how far we've come and what it has meant. You would think that uh, it would take a long time for this to sort of catch up, at least in the national consciousness. Our river walk is now continually winning awards as the best river walk in the mm -hmm. country against places like San Antonio, which had a little bit of a head start. Yes, but is. this has been a spectacular success so far. I mean, it's been incredible. I, you know, we embarked on it 20 years ago. The Conservancy was formed. Uh, we didn't think it was going to take us 20 years to do the three and a half miles, but. Even in that period of time, we expanded the vision of five and a half miles. We're going bridge to bridge now. We're going to have the Wilson Park on the west side. And, but it's just a, uh, it changed the community in so many different ways, the way people came together and the way people uh, enjoy the greatest asset that we have and have never been able to. Um, 
So I, I, I you know, it, it, I, I think it's been really important for us and uh, and real sense of accomplishment for all of us that have been involved. We're looking at pictures of it right yeah. now, Mark. Your same reflections from you. No, it's exciting to see. And, and one of the things I'm so excited about is watching families experience this for the first time. I mean, literally stacked up, lined up, yeah. trying to get out there, excited to be some of the first people to ever go to this place. I mean, think about it. When the tires were being made, there were about 10,000 people went there every day. But you couldn't get onto that site unless that was your, your job location, unless you're part of that industry. So for this to be so transformed, it just changes the narrative about the city. The other thing I'm excited about is 20 years. You know, a lot of times these, these ideas come together. You were a young man when this started. I was younger. <laughs> yeah, younger. Certainly. There we go. Uh, but a lot of times there these ideas go. come out and, you know, they're fun for a couple years. You never get to the finish line. They sort of start to get tired after 5, 10, 15 years. I think people love the Riverwalk more today than they did when it first started. Oh. And I think it's just become a huge source of community pride and community love, and, and that's what's so exciting to me. Uh, when you go down, anybody that hasn't take, availed themselves of it yet, you're really missing something. You see so many different walks of life, so people from using it in so many different ways. Um, that's, uh, I guess that's what you hope for when you start, but you it have is. no idea it is. that's how it's going to work out. You know, we started by reaching out to the community, engaging with everybody, say, what do you want? What would make it your riverfront? But you don't know until you open. You know, you open the doors and see what happens, right? And three and a half million people came last year. and. And people from all over. I mean, 25% from out of town, 25% from the suburbs, 50% Detroiters. Everybody coming together and enjoying themselves together. Uh, it, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, the original one was bring everybody. And uh, yeah. it's played out that way, and I think we're really proud of that. Yeah. I, Mark, I need to point to his, I'll ask him, uh, I'll ask you about it rather than him, about the role <laughs> that he's played in this, not just it, as its chair, yeah. but the generosity that he and his wife Karen have shown to this project. Yeah. We now have the Cullen Plaza, yes. the Cullen family carousel, yes. $4 million. Uh, yes. they've, they've, he's really, they've put the commitment where, the money where the mouth is, right? It's unbelievable. And again, you know, a lot of times an executive or Leader will come in, spend a couple of years, get something going, and then sort of fade off and let somebody else deal with it. That's incredible. Yeah, he's never lost a sense of the vision. He's never lost a sense of bringing the community together. Personally invested. You know, Karen comes to everything. Matt comes to everything. Yeah. They're just so wise in terms of advisory uh, roles and also in terms of bringing people to the table. And, you know, I've said this before. I think Matt is a genius at bringing people together. Yeah. Um, and I also think he's a genius at sharing credit. He's the last person to stand up and say, look at me. Uh, and it's it's remarkable Which is because- why I had to ask you about this <laughs> instead of him because he does specialize in the, yeah, yeah. oh shucks, it's not me, right? It's a lot of people. It, it is saying. a lot of people, but, but thank you. to be thank commended. You. Yeah, it's really I, I appreciate Mark, obviously yeah. your remarks it wouldn't happen without a great team and Mark and and Will Smith and, and Cassie Bresky, the, the conspiracy yeah. team's awesome. Yeah. So. Yeah. so what now? Now we're going west. Uh, we're going to uh, the Ambassador Bridge. We're going to be bridge to bridge, and uh, that's not enough. We're going to do the Joe Louis Greenway, 27 miles through the entire city. <laughs> Which is a um, well underway. massive project. Well underway, and uh, it's going to be something. We'll get yeah. it done, and that's going to be uh, in the near future. Hopefully it won't take us 20 years. It's going to be a shorter term project. <laughs> we're excited about it. That's right. No, and we're excited about that, too. I, I think that's one of the great things about the riverfront is, um, as you mentioned, not only is it drawing people to the riverfront from different backgrounds, different things there yeah, too yeah and I think one of the things that's clear to everyone is the Riverwalk is not just for you if you have a fancy bike and you're wearing spandex and, <laughs> and a helmet it's really for anybody yeah. uh, you can be there in a wheelchair you can be there with kids you can be there with seniors so that idea of just bringing people together giving people opportunities to be in nature making it just a little easier to get off the couch and do something different those are special and those are creating lifelong memories and and really yeah, again, bring that sense of pride back to the city. Well, and you deserve a ton of credit as well. Absolutely. Uh, 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 by the way, if you're a guitarist and you've never taken a look <laughs> at the handcrafted Mark Wallace guitars, I recommend those highly. Guys, congratulations and thanks for being thanks, here. Thanks, David. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. That's going to do it for us this morning. Thanks so much for being here. Have a great week. Meet the Press coming up next. We'll see you next time right back here for Flashpoint.